Paige, do you want to give it another minute to see uh, uh, some, for some late sign-ins? Yes, definitely. Uh, for those who are on the webinar at the moment, we're just uh, delaying a couple minutes just to make sure that uh, we can capture our audience. Please uh, hold with us. I'll give it one more minute, Mike. Okay, I think I'm gonna begin. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, today's program um, is a housing program uh, put on by CETUS, part of our Tools, Trends, and Techniques series. Uh, my name is Paige Bronk. I am the president of CETUS. Um, so thank you for joining us today. I also wanted to provide a special appreciation to Kevin Bielmeyer, who is the CETUS first vice president who coordinates uh, the committee to put these programs before us. Uh, today's program uh, basically will be moderated by Mike Goman from Goman in New York. Uh, it also includes a panel of experts. Uh, just a couple comments regarding CETUS, a couple plugs. CETUS is a non-for-profit membership organization committed to advancing Connecticut's economic development practices. Um, we have approximately 200 members from municipal, state, regional, private, and educational sectors. Our overall objectives include providing a forum for economic development, including networking. Um, also, we do we sponsor educational programs. We facilitate communication among partners and members. We foster sustainable economic growth in Connecticut and also prepare and support necessary legislation to improve Connecticut's economy. Uh, now on to today's program, I'll turn it over to Mike Goman. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you, Paige. Uh, appreciate the introduction. And I want to thank uh, Kevin Bill Meyer for his uh, work in helping us get this organized. As Paige uh, mentioned, this is uh, session three of the Tools, Trends, and Techniques series uh, sponsored by CETUS. And today's uh, session is on housing strategies. Uh, with me today are uh, Dr. Don Poland. Uh, Don is a uh, planner who runs our planning practice at Goma, New York, but is uh, known, uh, well known to many of you as a, a town planner and uh, educator in all things to do with planning and economic development. Uh, and in addition to uh, Don as a panelist is uh, Lewis Brown. Uh, Lewis Brown is a, a, an attorney and also a, a developer of affordable housing uh, with decades of experience in a number of markets across uh, the U.S. So uh, thank you, Don and, and Lewis, for joining me today. And uh, Don Poland has agreed to sort of kick off this discussion with a, a little bit of a, an overview of the, uh, of the issues related to housing development. So let me turn it over to Don. Thanks, Mike. Uh, just give me a minute here to share my screen, and I just want to use some slides to uh, ultimately frame what I'm going to talk about. Uh, so in, in this presentation, I, I want to kind of talk about the dynamic aspects of the housing market, and I think it's a need for us to move towards a plural, not a singular discussion about housing markets. Uh, we, we often tend to think, and especially like right now, you see media accounts that, you know, talk about the booming, you know, housing market and home values and so forth. And that's a very specific segment. So I think we need to, you know, segment our discussions around one spatial organization of housing, which I'll touch on in my next slide. Number two is the home ownership market versus the renter market, that they're really two different markets. That home buying 
uh, of existing product versus home building of new products are also another segment of the marketplace, single family versus multifamily. And then also income and cost as we start to talk about affordability, part of the focus of this program. So there was a book written, I believe, back in the 90s that said two thirds of everything can be explained by demographics, something that I truly believe. Uh, and it's demographic trends that are really impacting the housing markets and also affordability. And I'll touch on a few of them, but not all of them. And then housing costs and income, you could say the remaining third of things can be explained by normal distribution and housing costs and income uh, generally follow normal distribution with typically a skewedness towards higher income, especially in Connecticut. Spatial organization of housing markets, it's about accessibility and it's really about accessibility to jobs. So accessibility to transportation network and to job centers. So you'll see the per square foot value of housing decreases with its distance from the core or distance from job centers. Uh, and that's important, especially in a place like Connecticut. Not all communities are, are created equal in the context of housing value and housing affordability. So some demographic trends I think are important to understand. Uh, married couples with children have declined from 40% of total households in 1970 to 19% of total households in 2020. That is a dramatic shift in kind of household structure and a shift away from you know, the traditional family towards other non-traditional households. In America, there are 36 million one-person households. 20% of 28% of total households are single person. In Connecticut, and that's up from only 13% in 1960. In Connecticut, 29% of households are single person overall, and 42% of renter households are single person overall. This shift means the shift away from what we kind of think of as a conventional product. Fact is we have a lot of housing, especially large single family de detached housing that was built by prior generations for the needs of those prior households, large families with children uh, versus today. So in 2020, 33% of adults age 15 and over it was a data source that chose 15, not me, uh, had never been married, uh, which is up from 23% in 1950. The median age uh, to marry for the first time is 30.5 for men and 28.1 for women. That's up from 23.7 and 20.5 respectively in 1947. Today, 58% of adults from age 18 to 24 live in their parental homes, and that's up from 55% just in 2019. Today, the highest percentage of 18 to 34 year olds uh, are living with their parents since 1940. All of these changes in demographic structure are, are impacting our housing markets. And a big portion of it is this shift towards demand uh, more so for multifamily and, uh, you know, smaller footprints, small, uh, fewer number of bedrooms and so forth than previously. So now if we're talking about segmenting the marketplace and we're talking about affordability, I think it's important to look at some income and housing cost data. These two tables uh, cover Connecticut. They were taken from the U.S. Census. Uh, most recent data, I believe the 2021 uh, estimates. And what I want to point out here is just a few things, kind of the dominant portion of the total, you know, occupied household, in, occupied housing household incomes really falls between kind of the 50,000 and up. Uh, and that's where the predominant home ownership market is also. When we move over to the renter occupied market, we see a shift downwards in household income. And we also see that there's a fairly large percentage at the very lowest incomes. 
As far as housing costs go, we also see kind of a middling marketplace uh, here on total and owner occupied, and then a slight downward shift ultimately on the renter occupied. More importantly though, in the context of affordability, I think there's some key things that this table uh, shows us. The affordability issue is primarily a rental issue. That is, it's renter households, sorry, it's renter households that are most challenged by housing affordability, far more than owner-occupied households, as you see the much higher percents. And as income decreases, that is, we get down to the lowest income groups, affordability becomes the most challenging. In this discussion going further, I think it's also important to emphasize when we're talking about planning and land use at the municipal level, 8-30G, we're dealing with households at 60% and 80% AMI, which are actually above, uh, ultimately, above kind of where the greatest need for affordable housing is, in that the greatest need is below 50% AMI. <clears throat> Last slide that I want to touch on uh, is kind of using the Pew Research Center to look at what is middle income and upper income, and we could assume that below those middle income numbers is essentially low income. And it's done by household size, number of persons in the households. From a housing perspective, and especially from the discussions around housing in Connecticut, just making clear that when we're talking about 60, 60 and 80 percent AMI, we are talking about solidly middle class households. As we see here over on the right hand side, using the Hartford uh, region numbers provided by the State Department of Housing, at 60% AMI, we're going from 47,000 to 73,000. At 80% AMI, we're talking about households from 63,000 up to 97,000. This is in no way low income. That being said, the greatest needs are below 50% AMI. So with that, I will end there uh, and kick it over to Kevin, uh, to Lewis, sorry. Uh, because the, the primary thing, and I think that also often gets dropped out of the municipal discussion, is the limits of municipal government's ability to address affordable housing. That is, we can address those upper numbers uh, more easily than the lower numbers. And when you start dealing with 50% AMI and below, you need a larger toolbox that usually reliant on state and federal funding to achieve that. And that's Lewis's expertise. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Don. Uh, good information. And I, I, I like the comment about 60 80% AMI, AMI being solidly middle class. I don't think people tend to think of uh, those numbers that way. Uh, Lewis, uh, what's your reaction to some of this data? I would assume that you've seen some of it before, but uh, what, what's your reaction? No, thanks, Mike. Uh, thank you, Paige and Kevin. Thanks for the opportunity to join this group. Um, I've been looking forward to this conversation uh, since you asked me to participate in it. Um, so the, the data that Don just presented is extraordinarily, extraordinarily relevant to the conversation. If I could just take a step back, um, give a quick introduction uh, just to piggyback on, on Mike's. Uh, my name is Lewis Brown. My company is Honeycomb Real Estate Partners. We specialize in affordable workforce housing. Um, we're trying to do a better job as an industry as kind of defining what that is. I think Don helped to articulate it uh, just a few minutes ago. And, and I'll maybe put a little bit more detail on it. Um, I wanted to show a couple representative developments because everyone likes uh, pictures more than words. Um, and then I think, you know, importantly, open it up to a discussion. Um, this is a hot topic. It's all over the headlines, basically every day in every state and every locale that you, that you think about, not just Connecticut, um, coast to coast and, and up and down uh, north and south. So um, I, I generally work within a program called the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. Um, those that is one of the kind of tools that Don mentioned uh, these developments needing. That's that's one of the tools in the toolbox. And just by way of background, uh, the program's been around and was rolled out as a part of Ronald Reagan's tax reform. 
Act in 1986. And really since 1986, uh, the program, and I think it should be renamed, uh, but it hasn't been yet, has enjoyed bipartisan support, both sides of the aisle. There's actually a bipartisan uh, expansion bill that was just introduced last week um, to expand the program to really address what's become uh, a, an affordability crisis, a housing crisis of epic proportions. Uh, interestingly, the program, I would say, and I, I've described it as, you know, sometimes you hear about disruptive change as it relates to technology. I would say the program in 1986 was disruptive as it relates to the way our country thinks about now and thought about then affordable housing. So it really was a public-private partnership. Uh, it's structured as a tax benefit program to the limited partner investor. Uh, in most cases, that's a bank or an economic investor um, is more commonly an insurance company. And banks are able to satisfy their CRA requirements, the Community Reinvestment Act requirements by buying the tax credits on these developments. Uh, they can both be ground up and acquisition rehab and uh, that satisfies their CRA requirement and the, the purchase of those credits comes into the real estate development as equity in the deal. And the program until a couple of years ago was targeting, uh, as Don pointed out, 60% uh, of area median income and below. A couple of years ago that was expanded and I think importantly expanded to address 80% area median income earners and below, the caveat being that the total property um, needs to, on average, have 60 and below. And that addresses one of the key points that Don made. So uh, the it, Hartford uh, HUD just released new AMIs that are quite relevant. So just as a data point, um, Hartford area median income for a family of four um, just went up to $118,000 a year. That's 100% of area median income in Hartford County for a family of four. So if you do the math, uh, a family of four at 80% of area median income would be earning approximately $95,000. Um, so those are real significant earnings for a family. And those families would be uh, qualified to live in a property uh, with uh, rents that are restricted to that income level under the tax credit program. In this case, that would be $2,360 a month. So it's 30%. Uh, that's the way it's calculated, divided by 12. Um, and the benefit there is different from a market rate property under the tax credit program, your rents are restricted to that max and can only go up in a subsequent year if AMI grows. If AMI does not grow, then your rents are not going to go up. The other important point about the program for the renter is that same renter who qualifies in year one can in year two, go. their income can go up to 140% of area median income without worrying about being displaced because they no longer qualify for the program. So when I say it was disruptive change, I say that because um, a person was incentivized to improve their kind of economic standing uh, in a community and their own family without the risk of losing their housing. And that is quite important. It was quite different, actually, from an affordable housing standpoint. Um, so with that, I'm going to just show a couple of pictures. And I know we only have an hour, so I want to make sure we're leaving plenty of time. Um, this is, I'm going to share my screen quickly. Uh, Hopefully everyone can see this uh, funny but true cartoon um, that says, and this speaks to some of what Don was talking about, the dilemma for young adults, um, cities with affordable rent have high unemployment, but cities with jobs have expensive housing. And so I'm going to borrow, as I said, I was going to Don saying, um, you know, well, housing is, is really where jobs go at night. Um, in this cartoon, you see one person saying, I think it's a couple, uh, it's settled, we'll commute from Dayton, Ohio to San Francisco. Um, so, you know, it, sad but true. Um, that's, what, that's what we're facing today. 
And here, I want to just point out this data is certainly not as current as Don's. It, you can see that it's um, going from 2016 projected out to 2026. But really, these are salary, salary ranges for um, workers in our country, some of them essential, some of them in software. Um, and the correlation to housing wage versus median hourly wage um, and the statement that rent is becoming un unaffordable for many US workers. Um, there's some really dramatic statistics about uh, the fact that no, uh, no income, no one earning a minimum wage income can afford to live in a two bedroom or a one bedroom market rate apartment. They just, the numbers don't work. So with that, I wanna show a couple slides also of um, some developments that we're working on at Honeycomb to give you an idea of a cross section of, uh, you can visit our, our landing page, honeycombre.com for more information. But I wanted to just give this group an idea of some of the developments that we're working on. Uh, this is a 40 unit development in Chester, Connecticut. Uh, Chester is a, a hamlet in, in southern, the southeast Middlesex or southern Middlesex County. Lewis, you're, uh, you're not advancing on the screen. You can't Still. see my, oh, it says it's paused for some reason. Sorry. That's right. Maybe just uh, unshare and go back in. Sorry about that. Is that better? Yes. Uh yes. Just yeah, just okay. click just click your full screen uh button, your your slideshow button at the upper left. Uh the one that looks like a little little higher, little little slideshow, a little higher, a little higher. Nope. Sorry. Go up, 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 up. Keep going. Up in the upper bar. Sorry. A little higher. <laughs> There, click there. So this is Chester, Connecticut, uh, 40 apartments in eight buildings. Uh, we designed it so it was contextually uh, fit into the look and feel of Chester. Um, it is proximate and walking distance to the town center. Uh, importantly, it has access uh, to uh, water and sewer. Um, and the town has plenty of capacity. I think we'll get to some of those discussion points later. Um, it is one and two bedroom apartments. Uh, the town of Chester is about 3% of its 10% affordability goal. So there's quite a need here. Um, there's no restriction to senior or uh, non-senior. Um, so it's open to, to anyone that qualifies. And this, these will be affordable to residents earning 80% of area median income and below, um, similar to uh, what I just described. Um, the next is, uh, just to give kind of a, another uh, flavor of where, where we think it's uh, important to cite affordable housing, this is New Haven. It'll be 64 apartments. We received a Brownfield Award. It is a Transfer Act site, so we're cleaning up the site. It was the oldest dry cleaner in New Haven. It's on the corner of Derby and El Grasso, proximate to the Yale Bowl and the New Music uh, Outdoor Music Center, direct bus line to downtown, um, proximate to Yale employment uh, and other employment opportunities across the street from a school and a place of worship. Um, now, New Haven, as some may know, is, you know, has met its affordability in terms of 10 percent. That being said, uh, the dramatic increase in market rate housing has largely made housing for many unaffordable. So there still is quite a serious demand for affordable, quality affordable housing in the city. Again, this will be 100 percent affordable to um, uh, for ones, twos and three bedroom apartments, families earning 80 percent of area median income and below with the average being under 60%. Uh, 
uh, we are in uh, to CHFA and DOH with our full financing application and hope to close this and begin construction in the fall. Uh, Chester is behind. I didn't mention that, that that'll be likely Q1 of 2024. And the last is West Hartford. Um, so what I'm presenting here is uh, urban, now suburban. Um, the first two were new construction ground up. West Hartford's a very interesting, 44 apartments. It's an adaptive reuse and new construction, 900 Farmington Avenue. Uh, we're taking the West Hartford, what was the West Hartford, what is the West Hartford Inn? And we are turning 52 keys, uh, apartment keys into 24 affordable housing apartments and then building uh, perpendicular to that, the, the building that I'm showing here is new and that'll be 20 uh, new apartments. Uh, walking distance to the downtown West Hartford, um, proximate to Whole Foods, proximate to employment uh, on a major bus line. Um, water and sewer obviously is right there. And um, West Hartford too, similar to um, Chester, uh, is quite below its 10% threshold. Um, we are moving towards a summer closing um, and hope to be in the ground uh, late summer. Um, this is also affordable and to Don's point to residents earning 80% of area median income, 50% of area median income and 30%. So we're really trying to address a full range of need here um, to address all of those income levels. Uh, New Haven will be 80 uh, and 50 and Chester 80 and 50. Um, West Hartford, it, we're, we're able to address 30% area median income as well. And just to let you know, um, we're already receiving calls from prospective uh, renters, from prospective residents, even though we're not even in the ground. And I say that only to illustrate the dramatic need for affordable housing in these three areas, but really throughout the state. Um, Folks probably know that the governor has rolled out very um, aggressive and ambitious goals to address the affordable housing crisis for both um, capital A affordable housing, as well as um, I'd say lowercase, which is more geared towards the 60 to 120% area median income. Um, so there are some very robust programs that the state is has and is continuing to roll out to address uh, the housing crisis. Um, so with that, I'm going to, I think, stop sharing and turn it back over to Mike to moderate a Q&A. So Lewis, uh, the, just to be clear on what the West Hartford project, that's the conversion of an ex existing hotel? Correct. The West right. Hartford Inn currently has 52 rooms. It's currently an operating hotel. It used to be before the Delamar, um, the only hotel in West Hartford. Um, it COVID uh, had a significant impact on the West Hartford Inn, as did the Delamar. Um, and so we're converting the 52 rooms to 24 affordable apartments. There's a restaurant um, pad that's been uh, closed for years. Uh, we'll be scraping the restaurant and building 20 new apartments where the restaurant currently uh, sits. We're actually pulling it further back from the street. But yes, okay. that is uh, that is that site. So uh, I want to come back to Don about the, this question of what towns can do to attract more of uh, that kind of activity that you described. But before I do that, Lewis, you know, as a developer of this kind of housing, you know, what are the key factors or the considerations that you look for uh, when you're considering a site or market for one of your developments? So I'd say it's not dissimilar than any other developer. Um, you know, we look at um, site characteristics, so, you know, topography, access to utilities, those kind of key things. We look at, um, you know, our incomes, you know, kind of area median income, is it growing? Uh, because even though we are uh, operating within some constraints, um, the rent profile does go up to the extent that uh, area and median income is growing. So we'll look at those sort of trends. Um, but I think important to this conversation, uh, we're going into towns and looking for opportunities. New Haven not being, you know, New Haven being example of need, um, 
but we're also looking at high opportunity areas. So towns uh, like West Hartford or like Chester, where they have uh, a significant and a dramatic need to really have housing that's affordable, proximate to, to jobs. And many towns uh, in the state just don't have that, um, are well below the 10% threshold, do not have uh, adequate housing that's affordable to uh, essential workers, uh, to, to first year teachers, to first year firefighters, first year police right. officers, um, those sort of uh, essential workers, to uh, people that work in restaurants and, and other um, economic drivers within a town. Um, Importantly, though, too, we're looking and going in and having conversations early with town planners, with local government officials to understand, engage uh, what their kind of view is and how they're going to address um, this need. Um, oftentimes, unfortunately, some, some towns are quite vocal that they really have no intent to do anything um, and are not going to be collaborative. Um, but but really what we're seeing more is an appetite for towns to be a part of the process, to be a partner in the process. West Hartford, uh, Chester, and New Haven are three terrific examples of towns and cities where local government has stepped up and said, we want to be, we want to be your partner. We don't want to be an obstacle. Um, so that's refreshing. Uh, th there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. In right. Connecticut, we all know that towns had an obligation to uh, roll out their affordable housing plans. Not everyone has done that yet, but most have. And those plans articulate what their plan is to address um, what has become this real crisis that I mentioned. So my video is frozen, so you get to look at a portrait of me sort of uh, for the moment. But in any event, Don, uh, and I want to come back to Lewis with the same question, but Don, in your experience, uh, you know, are there things that towns should be doing to attract more affordable housing or from a, is it, is it a public policy land use permitting question? Is it outreach to the people that are against uh, that type of project? But what, what do you see that's, uh, that works in your opinion? Yeah, so I, I, I think there's kind of, you know, four areas or four things that communities should and could be doing. Uh, and part of it's just kind of creating an environment that's conducive to, you know, housing development, affordable or not. Uh, so I would say that foundation really starts with zoning, updating your zoning regulations to allow for a greater diversity of housing. And that diversity comes back to those demographic changes. The, the fact is we, we have a housing stock that is predominantly single family, detached, large, and designed for past generations. Uh, and there is a need for multifamily. Uh, if you go back to the early 2000s, only about 20% of housing permits were multifamily. Today, they're making up about 47% of total housing permits issued per year. That's a shift in the marketplace, ultimately. So multifamily housing, allowing more missing middle housing, uh, encouraging mixed use. And when I say mixed use, I mean residential and commercial proximate, not the new urbanist ideal of residential over commercial. Uh, I think in most cases we find that proximate location uh, being more feasible. Reduce reliance on special permits and conditional uses. Uh, greater density in areas with infrastructure, as kind of uh, Lewis had said and creating inclusionary provisions uh, to even require affordability as part of developments with just the caveat and caution of keep the percent of affordability low. Uh, the higher you put it, the more financially challenging it becomes uh, to make it work for a private sector developer not doing a LIHTC deal or what have you. So 10, 15 percent you know, affordability requirements uh, can be doable in many markets. The other three areas are then public participation, tax abatements, utilization of TIF, and uh, credit enhancement agreements. The fact is, even market rate housing is challenging to build in Connecticut from a financial feasibility standpoint. Uh, we've been involved in many market rate deals that have required, you know, tax participation, uh, public participation. And if you really want to get at the affordability issue, then the willingness to do tax abatements, TIF, and 
other incentives is needed. Uh, establishment of housing trust funds, uh, especially if that's linked to an inclusionary provision to allow a fee in lieu of affordable housing and therefore providing municipality with funding to directly uh, participate in developments. And then the other thing that I think is, isn't spoken about a lot, but I think an increase in local housing authorities, bringing them into more communities and ensuring that there's regional collaboration across housing authorities that allow vouchers to be transferable across communities. Uh, as we've seen recent media reports, that being a large kind of a barrier to the issuance of voucher programs and getting people into the housing that they need. So I'll stop there for now and kick it back to you, Mike. So Lewis, uh, from your perspective, what can towns do? You know, picking up on some of the things that Don, are there things there that, uh, that uh, uh, you want to elaborate on or things you'd like to add to that list? I, I mean, I think Don covered the waterfront. I, I would, I, I think zoning is key. Um, and and having uh, zoning that works more not just for affordable but you know other multifamily as well um, that is one of the uh, biggest issues that we face um, you know you can avail yourself of 830g uh, but ultimately um, you know that can be litigated um, whether or not it's meritorious or not uh, it can still result in in litigation which then costs everyone a lot of money and takes a lot of time. So oftentimes if if there's kind of the threat of that, some developers will just kind of go on to the next one. Um, the result of that is 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 not good for anybody. Um, real estate taxes are key um, in working within the tax credit program, as I mentioned, um, your your rent, your income potential is limited. Um, and so you need to have other, um, opportunities to kind of have an NOI that works for the deal. And one of the only places that you can pick that up is if the municipality is willing to work with you on real estate taxes. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily zero taxes. That just means entering into agreement that's fixed and certain. Um, and oftentimes you run into resistance, or I've run into resistance, even where you have a property that is not performing, um, the town still uh, is not wanting to work with you on real estate taxes, or where you have a non-performing, or excuse me, a, a, a property that's not even on the tax rolls, uh, and you're bringing it onto the tax rolls just at a lower than market rate number. So the town is still getting something, just maybe not as much as it would get if it were an unrestricted property. So real estate taxes are key. And the third, um, you know, it's not necessarily a town issue, but it ends up being kind of inextricable is nimbyism, not in my backyard. And oftentimes the squeaky wheel when nimbyism really is, is loud, um, oftentimes uh, local government officials are understandably, I was, I was a lawyer for the city of Boston for, for a number of years. So I understand how that side works. Um, but that squeaky wheel oftentimes starts driving decisions. And, and those decisions aren't necessarily in the interest of what the town really needs. Um, so nimbyism is a, is a key issue. Um, so I'd say those three. So if towns are willing to really do what's right, um, despite and in the face of nimbyism, um, that goes a long way. Sorry, the uh, yeah, I agree with the, uh, the your last comment about nimbyism, and of course the other ones are the uh, the uh, not in anyone's backyard, and then the nopes, the not on planet Earth, or the bananas that build absolutely nothing anywhere near anyone. Uh, so we've taken that to a fine art in uh, Connecticut. You know, I I think to that point, it strikes me that uh, maybe a state agency of some kind ought to. Uh, embark on a bit of a campaign to explain to uh, residents, Connecticut residents, uh, what uh, affordable housing is aimed at and some of the income numbers that we've uh, been talking about here uh, this afternoon and who will live in these places. I mean, I think, unfortunately, just the whole uh, uh, the phrase affordable housing 
uh, conjures up, uh, you know, housing projects that people think of existing in the 70s that, you know, became uh, places that, uh, uh, you know, had a lot of crime and all kinds of bad, bad behavior. But that's really not what we're talking about uh, with the projects that have been proposed around Connecticut in recent years and which have run up against a lot of NIMBYism. And that's too bad. And I, I think it, uh, there, it would, a uh, public education program would certainly help. Um, a, a couple of questions from the audience, and I'd encourage people to continue to put them in the chat window. Uh, there is a question about whether or not towns uh, should, be, be, uh, should be being more proactive. Uh, and, and in that regard, for example, uh, acquiring land uh, specifically to make it available for affordable housing projects. And, either donating that land uh, or uh, subtracting the value uh, from it somehow, either through uh, some of the tax incentives Don spoke about or other mechanisms. But uh, what, uh, from either one of you, what's your response to that? Should towns be more proactive and go out and acquire sites uh, to help uh, get these projects uh, moving? I'm gonna give a mixed answer of kind of yes and no. Uh, I think first and foremost, towns can be proactive with their existing, existing holdings of land and evaluation of what you own and what you may be able to dispose of. Uh, as we've seen declining enrollments in schools, we see an increase in the shuttering of school properties and often the opportunities for redevelopment of those properties. So I think those are good instances. Uh, I'm a little more cautious on the going out and purchasing land. Just it makes me feel kind of government heading in the direction of developer. And I think government should often avoid trying to be the developer. So yeah, if opportunities avail themselves where you could acquire land to make available for affordable housing, then I think, sure, do it. How proactively you go out there seeking land and trying to pull that off, I'd just be a little more cautious with. Lewis, any response to that idea? I, I agree with the, the mixed uh, kind of answer. Uh, just happens uh, that we just submitted uh, for an RFP in Rhode Island uh, where the quasi-government authority had actually done just that and then was going out to developers um, to create affordable and workforce housing in that area. I'd say it, it could be, if done right, a powerful tool, particularly in light of what we've been talking about where um, oftentimes NIMBYism um, when a private developer comes in, can you know steer the ship? If the town can, controls the land and what that and has you know done some sort of zoning change to the land to affect um, the ultimate end use, I think that it could be a potentially a powerful tool um, for maybe circumventing uh, some of the impediments and obstacles that that we've been talking about this morning. Um, I agree with Don. Um, and, and have done uh, both in and out of Connecticut adaptive reuse of schools. Um, that is um, a, a great tool. Um, oftentimes, uh, we just, uh, my old company actually completed uh, adaptive reuse of a historic school in Cleveland um, that was se that senior housing. Um, so they, that the way the classrooms are laid out, they often tend to work out well as senior affordable housing. Um, and then you're preserving a historic building structure. So that's that's quite nice also from, um, you know, kind of a minimizing impact standpoint and not having all new construction preservation sure. standpoint sure. Is, is nice. So I, I agree with Don's mixed approach. I do think it has the potential to work if done correctly. You know, I think the uh, uh, it's just a, uh, another way to participate uh, in getting the numbers to work, right? You know, it's whether the town comes in with some sort of financial incentive or comes in with land, it, it's, a, it's a way that the town can participate financially. And that's to Don's point that, you know, even market rate projects in Connecticut uh, in the last number of years require some level of forbearance from the town to make the numbers work. Uh, let's move on. Another question, uh, Lewis, this is on LIHTC deals, and uh, the question is around evaluating the keys for evaluating projects, so LIHTC projects, and specifically whether there's a minimum unit count uh, that works for LIHTC deals. Uh, 
given syndication and other financing and other requirements. Sure. So our smallest deal and the one that I I, I showed first is Chester. That's 40 apartments. I generally think that we would not, um, and that's not to say it can't be done, um, but it becomes harder both from a economies of scale standpoint as well as att attracting kind of the in investors that, that I mentioned to go much smaller than that. Um, investors are looking to write big checks. And so the smaller the deal, uh, the hard it, harder it is to attract that, uh, that equity investment, um, which puts them, so it, it, you, can, you can get it, but your pricing on the tax credit is gonna be lower and therefore puts more pressure kind of on your capital stack. Um, so 40 apartments, I think is, you know, kind of our base of kind of where we see um, development working with the cost of construction and interest rates that obviously has been a big factor um, and put much more pressure on smaller uh, smaller development deals. So thank you, uh, Lewis. Mm -hmm. uh, another question uh, about uh, TIF, tax increment financing. And of course, uh, I think everybody's familiar with the changes that were made in 2015 to Connecticut's uh, TIF regulations. But uh, the comment here is that it doesn't appear to be used very much and you know, why is that? Uh, some towns have really embraced it, others have not. And and what's behind that? Is it a lack of understanding of TIF, uh, you know, and how it can be effective? Or is it that uh, TIF is somehow uh, just not going to work uh, in, in a specific community? But, uh, you know, we have, at uh, Golden York, we have our thoughts on that. But Lewis, why don't you, uh, if you don't mind responding to uh, this question of TIF? So, I mean, candidly, it's not a strategy that I've employed. Um, it, so I, I can't artfully speak to it um, or the whys behind it's not being used uh, as widely as maybe some think it should be. It's uh, it's just not something that I've used as, and maybe this is a good example. I've been doing it for 20 years and I've never uh, done a TIF deal. Um, so yeah, I'd be enough. interested to know, Mike, kind of what your thoughts are. Well, we, it's a question we get asked fairly frequently. And our answer is that the, the issue with TIF is that A, uh, there is uh, some organizational work, quite a bit of organizational work and overhead related to uh, going through the process of uh, underwriting and then selling tax increment financing bonds, whether they are special revenue bonds, which is typically what's used, or general obligation bonds, which are, are I don't know that they've been used much at all in Connecticut, but uh, there, there's a lot of work in underwriting and a lot of work and cost in actually issuing the bonds for TIF. And, uh, and if that's A, uh, B on this issue is uh, that, again, it's sort of like the question about contributing land. How can communities uh, help make the numbers work so that these projects go ahead? And, you know, certainly contributing lands one way, TIF would be another way. But there are other tools, many of which uh, these, this audience is familiar with, including you know, tax abatements and tax fixing agreements. Uh, Don mentioned credit enhancement agreements. They, they're they a good tool uh, for uh, to, to accomplish kind of the same goals as TIF does. And then finally, uh, you know, you can use things like waivers of uh, building or permitting fees uh, as a way of helping uh, a project, uh, uh, the numbers on a project make sense. And I, I think the, the other comment I should make about TIF is, uh, because of the cost and the time and the work involved in, in putting a TIF uh, deal together, it, it has to be a big deal. It can't be uh, something where you're raising a couple of million dollars. It's just too much work to do that. So it's really got to be a, a deal where TIF would come in for, generally, we assume, that, you know, if it's less than 10 million that's going to be raised through TIF, it's probably just too much work. And there are better ways for towns to play a role financially in helping a project get done. Um, Mike, if I could just add to it, I, I think one, there is a lack of understanding. I think there's a complexity of what you're getting to. Uh, number two is I, I think tax abatements and tax fixing agreements are just a lot cleaner and simpler. Uh, but then number three is I'd say the value on where TIF has been used is on the credit enhancement agreement side. Most of the deals I've been involved in that have gone the TIF route are doing the credit enhancement, not the actual issuing of bonds through the TIF. Right, right. Uh, question about, uh, are, are we seeing any uh, 
uh, ways to incentivize private landowners to donate or sell at lower market rates in order to facilitate affordable housing and particularly the nonprofit uh, developers of affordable housing. I, I would say that probably, uh, Lewis, you might want to comment on this, but there are a lot of affordable housing developers who would say that they, although they didn't intend to be nonprofit, they ended up being nonprofit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, is there any, are we seeing any uh, incentives for private landowners to, for example, donate, donate land uh, for the purpose of uh, helping uh, affordable housing projects? Well, there, I mean, there obviously could be the corresponding tax benefit that they would realize. But uh, I guess from my perspective, I'll answer it a little bit differently. I thank you for the question. Um, I have historically um, partnered with nonprofits um, and and been able to put together a strategic partnership where the nonprofit um, participated in the development with the for-profit developer. Um, and depending on um, kind of the mission of the nonprofit. Sometimes that nonprofit will bring kind of the service side of the equation to the development where we like to provide service services to residents. But two, um, I'm talking with a, a nonprofit in Hartford that I've done one development with, and we'll be 50/50 partners. Um, and the re and 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 that nonprofit will be you know a co-developer because they hold that expertise. But what they also bring to the table is access to different types of financing mechanisms that allow the deal to be viable. Um, I've also worked with nonprofits who are actually the owner of the land, and that's their contribution into the partnership. And therefore, they're kind of able to monetize that contribution in a way that might they might not normally uh, be able to while also uh, staying in the partnership and preserving their mission of uh, creating affordable housing. So I think that there's some interesting structures where there's a collaboration or joint venture between for-profits and nonprofit, each of which can bring different things to the table. So um, th that can be quite a powerful, uh, powerful partnership. Thanks, Louis. Uh, Don, there's a question in the chat about uh, the resistance to multifamily housing being based upon uh, an increase in the cost of providing services like schools and fire and police. I know you've done extensive research on this for years. Do you want to comment on that issue? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. It's also extremely frustrating. Uh, I, I, I wish I had the you know silver bullet answer to it, but there is no simple answer. Uh, I feel like every night of the week I'm out there fighting the fight for it. Uh, that being said, I, I mean, I think there's a few things. As I think Lewis used my phrase earlier, housing is where jobs go at night. So from an economic development perspective, from a see this perspective, uh, you know, I think there needs to be a narrative about the symbiotic relationship between uh, jobs and housing and that we need housing. I think number two, the, the demographic stuff that I touch on that just, you know, demographics change slowly. They hide in plain sight. We don't notice, you know, those dramatic changes. So, you know, most of the times with planning and zoning commissions, they think every new housing unit is going to produce one, two or three school age children. And the fact is, I mean, statewide households to enrollments uh so a household is an occupied housing unit uh 0.35 enrollments per housing unit per household uh i'm doing an analysis on the town right now they're 0.2 enrollments per housing unit uh the fact is housing overall generates very few enrollments because we have an aging population so i think the demographic message needs to get out there I think also just the recognizing that, especially with multifamily apartments, they are a commercial real estate asset. Uh, yeah, they're residential in use, but they're a commercial real estate, they're an investment tool. And the fact is their draw on government services is low, the taxes they pay are high, and I've yet to do a fiscal impact analysis that has found a multifamily development to be negative on its fiscal impact. They more than pay their fair share, both in education and general government services. 
So I think in part of it is we have a big education process ahead of us that we need to continue to educate commissions and, you know, residents and communities as a whole. I think at the end of the day, though, some of the fiscal stuff um, and some of the other stuff just becomes easy to use that at the end of the day, for whatever reason, communities don't want change. It's an NIMBY response. They don't want anything different. So it's very easy to say, oh, that multifamily housing is going to cost us uh, and so forth. So I'll end there. Otherwise, I'll keep on going for hours. <laughs> OK, thank you, Don. <laughs> uh, you know, look, on, on general uh, multifamily housing, our research consistently shows that there's four uh, groups uh, of uh, residents that uh, take up the vast majority of rental housing. And they are uh, retirees, you know, people that have sold their house and they've retired and they want to stay in their community. Uh, those who are empty nesters and maybe within sight of retirement, and they're still working, uh, but their kids are gone. And, uh, you know, they don't want the big house. They may have a house somewhere else uh, that they go to down by the shoreline or wherever else. And they don't want the big house anymore, uh, but they want, again, they want to stay in your community. Uh, the third group is the, the double income, no kids, the dinks, as we call them. And that's the young professional couple, you know, mostly usually earning over six figures. And, you know, they're either saving for a home or they've decided to put off buying a home for one reason or another. But they're very active in your community in terms of shopping and eating and so on. And then the last uh, is a, a rather a little bit newer group. And we, we haven't found a nice way to refer to them except just to say what they are, which is recently divorced. And uh, we see a lot of late 40s, uh, particularly women, late 40s women and early 50s who have gone through a divorce. Uh, they want to live in a, in a nice uh, setting close to uh, 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 facilities and so on and shopping and dining and so on. And they want it to be secure and they want the amenities. So it's those four groups. And if you run down the list of all four of them, I mean, they're great additions to your community. And I think that uh, goes right across the waterfront in terms of pricing, whether it's market rate or whether it's affordable. It's the same groups that we see over and over again. And uh, as Don says, in all the work that we've done, uh, we have yet to see one of these projects uh, not be uh, anything but a substantial fiscal contributor to the community in a big way. Anyway, uh, any can I, can I add one, can I, or yeah, just one other thing, if I could just piggyback on that, Mike, uh, and I think it's important. Um, there's been a, a number of studies. Uh, Cohn Resnick has done one. Harvard, uh, together with HUD, has done one. Affordable housing as a real estate asset class uh, had historically, has historically the lowest default rate of any uh, real estate asset class. And, and maybe that speaks to the crisis that we're in because um, there's such a demand. Uh, on the other hand, I like to think that um, it speaks to the quality of the housing that were provided and the quality of the resident that's staying there, um, number one. Number two, there's also data, and, and Don probably can rattle this off much uh, more artfully than I, but that affordable housing actually is uh, shown to raise uh, property values in communities, not cause the opposite effect. So I think you know it's incumbent upon all of us to get out and tell the real story and not let the narrative um, kind of get away from us. Uh, that that's kind of how I would I would end it. Good, I agree, Louis. Thank you, uh, Don. Any final comments? Uh, no, I just want to thank you guys for having me yeah. here. Yeah. So, Louis, yeah. it's been a great discussion. Well, thank you, and and thank you, Louis. Uh, much thank appreciated you. that you take the time to do some prep work and then participate in today's session. Uh, I also need to thank uh, Paige uh, and uh, Kevin at CETUS. Uh, for their help in getting these things together as we go along. There's always a lot of things that got, have to be done in the background, and uh, both uh, Paige and Kevin have been great uh, uh, to help kind of keep us uh, focused and keep us organized and moving this program ahead. We hope this has been worthwhile. I need to also just quickly thank Danielle Walker. Danielle has been the person in the background getting these Zoom sessions set up and making sure that we're all there on time and it runs smoothly. So I don't see her here, but hopefully somebody else sent her a note maybe. Oh, there she is. Hi, Daniel. Uh, thank you for all the work that you've done in the last three sessions and uh, keeping these things running smoothly. Thanks, everyone. 
Uh, glad you could join us today and I look forward to talking to many of you again soon. Mike, I'm just going to chime in here at the end. Thanks uh, from CETUS uh, for your participation. Again, this is the second year at the Goldman in New York has, has uh, supplied some very uh, informative webinars uh, this year. So I want to uh, let everyone know that if you if you uh, would like to hear the previous webinars, they're recorded and they, you can find them on the CETUS website, uh, CETUS.org. Um, and you go to events and you can you can uh, see the previous se sessions that we've done this year, uh, as well as this one. This will also be uh, uh, posted on there as well. CCM is our admin for CETUS, so they're doing a great job for us uh, providing all this content. Um, the contact information for, for Lewis and, and Don and, and Mike will also be uh, going out, I, I believe, after this session gets all wrapped up. Uh, a link goes out to everybody that was on this session so that you can certainly have everybody's uh, contact information for, frankly, for follow-up questions, because I think we just scratched the surface, even though we did have a lot in this hour. Uh, you know, there, there's so many questions. And, you know, one of the things that was mentioned in the chat is uh, is Windsor is an example of uh, where TIF has been used effectively. So, you know, reach out to uh, to, to Windsor Economic Development for more information, uh, uh, Dan, and others on, on TIF. And lastly, I just want to uh, do a plug for our upcoming program, uh, from CETUS. Uh, it's a double header, actually. It's on the same day on the 24th, which is uh, next uh, Wednesday, a week from today. Uh, there'll be a there'll be a, a double header, two events happening in. Um, um, well, actually, I, I'm, I'm making it sound like they're both in the same town. They're not. They're both news. So in the morning, we have New Britain and it's an in-person event. Uh, the new New Britain it begins at 10 o'clock. Uh, 10 to 1130. Uh, you can check out all the details again on the CETUS website. And, uh, and and in the evening is a new London event, uh, also in person from five to seven. So both events uh, partnering with CETUS, uh, go to CETUS.org uh, for those details. And uh, with that, we uh, wish you a, a wonderful day and thanks for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you.